Well, good afternoon, everyone. Before we start today's briefing, I want to acknowledge the tragedy that took place over the weekend where a Canadian Armed Forces or Snowbirds plane went down in Kamloops, B.C. Of course, we all know that this is a tragedy that came at a time when the Snowbirds themselves were on tour called Operation Inspiration. The goal of that tour was to lift the spirits of Canadians during this pandemic and to pay tribute to the victims of the, those who lost lives as a result of the virus, but also paying tribute to those that are battling on the front lines. Our thoughts today are with uh, the family of Captain Jennifer Casey, whose life was taken in the crash. And of course, she was from our neighboring province in Nova Scotia, has, who has been dealt with a number of uh, hardships in recent weeks. We are also thinking about the family of Captain McDougall, who was recovering from serious injuries. We, of course, wish him a speedy, safe, and full recovery. At this point, I would now uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, since the media advisory yesterday, we have no new positive cases, and the total number of cases in our province remains at 260, with 242 cases in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, four in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. 52% of cases are female and 48% are male, and by age we have 22 under the age of 20, 38 between 20 and 39, 38 between 40 and 49, 58 between 50 and 59, 57 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. Three people are in hospital due to the virus, and of these patients, one is in intensive care. 250 people have now recovered, and in total, we have tested 10,747 people. Another weekend in our province with no new confirmed cases of COVID-19 is certainly cause for hope and optimism in knowing our actions are working to protect our loved ones, ourselves, and the people in our community most susceptible to this virus. I am grateful for your commitment and discipline in following the public health orders in place, despite the personal restrictions and hardships we are all experiencing at this time. And I know many are wondering why can't we move through the level faster, given that we've had no cases for so long. And the answer lies in the nature of the virus itself. We know this virus can incubate for up to 14 days, and some people can have the virus and not realize it until their symptoms become severe enough to present to hospital. And this can take two to three weeks as well. So we must be patient and allow enough time to see the results of our decisions and actions. And in this case, that's two incubation periods or 28 days. So while on the surface it seems as if these measures are not needed at this time of low case counts, they definitely are. And this is the paradox of public health. When we are doing things right, it seems as though nothing is happening and people are getting frustrated, wondering why we must still adhere to the measures in place, when in actual fact, the reason we are not seeing any new cases is because, these, because of these very measures. And if they weren't in place, COVID-19 would now look very different in our province. Globally, there is still much to learn about COVID-19, but every day we are learning more and we know how to prevent this infection and slow its spread. And we know that to overcome it will take our continued hard work and dedication, our ability to make difficult decisions, and to adapt as necessary moving forward. We have already made considerable progress against this virus, and as long as we stay focused and determined, we will successfully see it through. However, we, doing so requires us to continue practicing the proven prevention methods that we have all come to depend on. So please continue to wash your hands often and well, cover your coughs and sneezes, Stay at home as much as possible, especially if you're unwell, and maintain safe physical distance of at least two arms lengths from others when in public spaces, and wear a non-medical mask or cloth mask when that's not possible. These measures are just as important now as at the height of the pandemic curve. Although this past weekend marks the unofficial start of summer in our province and the festivities and seasonal traditions we look forward to each year, this summer will no, no doubt be different. And that's not to say we will not be able to do the things we enjoy, but rather we will have to do them a little differently on a smaller scale and, and within our bubbles. I know this will be a difficult adjustment for many, but rather than focusing on what we cannot do, instead, I encourage all of us to focus on what we can do. 
Despite the challenges COVID-19 has presented, let us not lose sight of the opportunity has, it has provided to slow down and spend quality time with those we hold dear. I'm happy to see so many people being physically active, hiking, bike riding, and simply enjoying the outdoors. Consider taking advantage of any downtime to begin a new hobby or learn a new skill or try something new. It could positively affect your, both your physical and mental health and well-being. I would like to acknowledge today Mark's World Family Doctor Day, an important opportunity to highlight the invaluable role and contribution of family physicians in our province, in our provincial health care system. Family doctors are working hard to help keep us healthy during this pandemic, and I offer each of you my sincere appreciation and gratitude for adjusting your practices to ensure you are there and ready to care for your parent, patients in this unprecedented time. You are vital to our system and our response to COVID-19, so thank you. As a recap, for those who may have just joined, we have no new cases since yesterday's media advisory. The total of cases in our province remains at 260, with 242 in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, four in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. The combined strength and resilience of people in this province has never been more clear. And it is our common values and shared bonds of hope and courage that will keep us united as we continue to face this pandemic. We have already come so far, and I know that together we will go to the distance. Hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, and thank you for everyone, as you just mentioned, that this also marks World Family Doctor Day, which presents us as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, with another opportunity to highlight what is a significant role and contributions that family doctors maintain throughout Newfoundland and Labrador and our healthcare system. It is especially important at this time when they face with the additional challenges because of this pandemic. So making World Family Doctor Day also presents us with the opportunity to celebrate the progress that is being made by family medicine and the special contributions of family doctors, not just around the world, but especially right here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I'm sending a virtual bouquet today to all our family doctors for their efforts. We thank you. So if we just switch gears uh, for a moment or two about today's numbers. Dr. Fitzgerald has mentioned already that we are at day 12 now of no new cases of COVID-19 in our province. So to all residents of Newfoundland and Labrador, keep up the great work. Your actions are providing some great results. This is exactly what we've been striving for and is exactly what we want to see for our province and we, as we start looking forward uh, towards the next phase in our plan. The next phase is Alert Level 3, uh, NL Life with COVID-19, a foundation for living with this virus. The results we are sending for the last 12 days or seeing in the last 12 days is an indication that you are adjusting life to living with the virus. I've seen lots of great examples of this as we travel across the province this weekend. So keep it going. In fact, today most Atlantic provinces have reported either no new cases or a very low number of uh, new cases. So now sticking with the news over the weekend, the federal government announced an annual increase to the Canada Child Benefit. This is a tax-free support that will be increased in July, and this is meant to help families pay for things like food, clothes, and activities that they can do together at home. This increase will be in place for the year of 2020 to 2021. That's the benefit year, and it will raise the maximum benefit to just under $6,800 per child under the age of six, and just over $5,700 per child for child that's aged between 6 through 17. So in addition to that, the federal government announced up to $100 million in funding for uh, the Red Cross. And the Red Cross, of course, has stepped up to meet extra demand due to COVID-19. But they also are available, the Red Cross is always available to support floods and wildfires and relief efforts across our country. Uh, the Red Cross, the Canadian Red Cross, will use the funding in areas like adapting their operations to COVID-19 and supporting quarantine and isolation sites and also training healthcare sector and essential workers on using PPE at their work sites. So this is some support, extra support for the Canadian Red Cross. Also about an hour ago, they announced the expansion of support for workers and small businesses. And this means that the eligibility criteria for the Canadian 
emergency business account will include many opera owner-operated small businesses. And this support will allow more small businesses to access interest-free loans that will help them cover operating costs during a period when, as we know, revenues have been reduced due to the pandemic. A particular note also that uh, today they've, com they've confirmed that the Canada-U.S. border will remain closed for a month for non-essential travelers. Now here in our province, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we've been working hard on a number of areas that we can support you as well. This includes enhancing many government services that are available online as we have focused expanding the digital delivery service for government workers. So this, this of course, is when many of our, our business or walk-in, at least, services have been shut down. So now moving to the digital platform that we've outlined in the Way Forward plan it really makes it easier for residents and businesses to access government services. So the work that we've done is paying off and during this pandemic but it is also allowing us to continue to deliver the important services to you during a time of significant disruption. And the stats, us tell it, the stats are telling us that these changes are working. With motor re registration as one example, in April there were almost of the 45,000 vehicles that were renewed, 98% of those were renewed online. That's a 10% increase just in one month over the month of March. If you uh, look at the stats around driver's license, of almost 55,000 that were renewed, 92% were renewed online, and that's nearly doubled since last year. So the changes are working and people are adapting. So more people are accessing the digital services than ever before uh, this COVID-19 situation started. I guess you could say that's part of the new normal uh, for government operations. So. There's other developments that I would just want to mention today. This would be around the area of MCP. So starting today, all users of the MyGovNL platform, and you can set up your own account there, but on that platform you can now link your MCP account uh, to, uh, to their profile. This allows you to access your MCP-related information and services, but you could use the, the online platform as well to sign up for organ and tissue donate, uh, don donations. And these are just a few simple, simple steps by accessing the MyGovNL and your MCP uh, uh, account information. Also, which is important to know that I know many people now who with expired cards will receive an email reminding you of upcoming renewal. So these are just a, a few little changes that we're making if you want to renew your MCP and to su support some of the other services that are attached to it. As we have said from day one, we are doing everything that we can to support you and your loved ones, your families through this pandemic and we will continue our work. So sometimes these simple changes can make it very easy for you to access those government services and doing it uh, from your homes. So this is really a, a gradual change to put on our province, to put our province on a path that will be a new normal for many of us. So we know this will take some time as we need, as we need to make sure we maintain our, our patients. As Dr. Fitzgerald has just already said, the changes that have been, and special measures that have been put in place are put there to uh, stop the spread of COVID-19 in, in our province. The changes are working and your patience is required to make sure we continue uh, the success. The alert system that has been put in place is about making responsive actions, identifying risk, and protecting our most vulnerable. And in doing, we do so based on evidence-based decision-making. And also, I know from time to time, as we move into Alert Level 3, there's lots of questions around guidelines, especially for businesses and organizations, as they put their plans in place for reopening. So keep in mind that the COVID-19 website has lots of information there, both specific and in general. Go to the businesses and employer section. You will there see a variety of resources, both guidance and information sheets, and then not just in a general sense, but also for sector-specific direction. So we encourage you to continue to utilize the website. There's a lot of information there, both on the provincial and federal, federal supports that we've been putting in place. The website was created for easy access to, the, to this information for you. It's updated daily. So once again, in, in conclusion today, keep up the great work. Uh, your work is paying off, it is working, so let's all of us continue to lead by example. And for now, I will turn it over to the Minister, Minister Hagee, for his comments today.
Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and well done, everyone. Uh, we have 12 days with no cases, and that's great news. And as Dr. Fitzgerald said, it's obvious that we are, uh, by and large, doing things right. Uh, again, it is World Family Doctors Day, and the Premier and Dr. Fitzgerald have both referenced that. I come from a slightly different background in, in medicine, mm. but I can tell you without fear of contradiction that uh, the good foundation for specialist care is the, the rock on which primary care puts us. Uh, one cannot exist properly without the other. The focus of our mandate has been to develop primary health care teams to allow physicians to, uh, to concentrate on the the, the, the high value adds that they bring to primary care and to allow uh, others to work to their full scope of practice. And the Family Practice Renewal Network with the NLMA, the Newfoundland and Labrador Medical Association, has been instrumental in doing that. Uh, and we, through government, have funded a lot of their activities. One of the things that COVID has brought uh, is a more rapid shift towards virtual care. Uh, this was a concept that's been around many years. And in actual fact, Back in the day, Newfoundland and Labrador led the world with what was then called telehealth. Uh, this has morphed and changed over the, uh, the decades, and we now find ourselves in a situation where with smartphones and broadband access, uh, there really is the reality of having uh, uh, almost at the tip of your fingers uh, uh, healthcare advice on, on parallel anywhere else. It has had obvious benefits uh, in, uh, in covid uh, we've seen a significant shift uh, in primary care with nearly 100,000 consults um, delivered by primary care physicians to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, whereby they could receive care and advice in their own home uh, and don't actually have to travel uh, or burst their bubble. And that's obviously a, a huge, a huge benefit to them. One of the things we're going to have to do, uh, and it started already, is to look at some of the lessons from the system point of view, as to how we can make virtual care better, how we can make it easier. And I think there's a lot of jurisdictions that are, uh, are, are evaluating what they have managed to achieve. I think one of our challenges now is to uh, engage specialists more fully in this transition from uh, office-based, clinic-based uh, consultation to the virtual world. Um, uh, older, um, more challenged patients, uh, and uh, the, the nature of consultations are such that a lot of this could be done online with benefit to everybody, uh, and uh, we'll be working through that over the coming uh, months as we come to terms with COVID uh, and hopefully work our way down the alert levels over the next little while. I think uh, it's been an interesting weekend. Uh, the report card on this weekend should come out at the beginning of June. Uh, if we did as well as we did with Easter, we have uh, uh, something to be proud of. And if we didn't, we're still in a, a stage where we are prepared to be able to handle a resurgence of cases. So, again, the jury's out on that one. Uh, travel, though, has become something topical. Uh, and I think one of the challenges we have is that, as I said on Friday, uh, a single in, uh, post on Facebook, a rumor started, uh, we'll go around the province several times before the truth has a chance to get out there. Uh, we've seen echoes of that over the weekend, and I just thought it prudent and useful to use this opportunity again to emphasize that all inbound um, individuals coming into the province are met uh, and have their credentials checked against the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health requirements. So people who come in, whether their uh, car has an Alberta plate or a Florida plate, or a Newfoundland and Labrador plate, have had their, uh, their eligibility against the medical criteria checked. So they are either resident Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, and I know some who have had trouble with flights, and so they brought their, their Florida vehicle back uh, for the summer. Uh, they are exempted workers, or they are people who have exemptions for compassionate reasons. And that has been a, a, a topic of considerable concern to us as well as everyone else, trying to make sure we balance uh, that issue of compassion and care uh, and empathy with the need to safeguard public health. So again, just in closing, bubbles still matter. Protect your own, 
don't uh, jeopardize, don't prick anybody else's. Because remember, the virus only moves when you do. We have done so well. Uh, the, uh, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and I think it would be a shame if we flipped back. The challenge for all of us is to keep that same level of discipline we've had for the last 70 odd or more days and keep that uh, running into the beginning of June and through these various levels. Uh, so with that, Premier, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hege, and I now turn it over to the media for uh, today's questions. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have six reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they registered for today's call. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, there will be an opportunity for single questions. This call will end at 2.59 p.m., and further questions can be emailed. Our first questions today are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. A question for um, either the Chief Medical Officer of Health or the Minister. Uh, I've heard from sources that the lab here is in the process of doing validation for antibody testing. What's the timeline for this, and what's the plan for how this test will be used? Um, so at the moment, uh, they are in the process of doing some validation. Um, I am not uh, clear as to how long or what the timeline is on that. Um, you know, and uh, we will be taking um, advice and recommendations. There is a national or an FPT committee um, that is looking at antibody testing and how best to use it. Uh, and we'll certainly be paying attention to that uh, information when it comes out in that guidance to direct uh, how we'll be using this testing. If you look at Iceland, it's allowing tourism to go ahead this summer by testing every visitor uh, who arrives. With our isolation plan in place, it's effectively killed off what is a billion dollar industry here. With so much at stake, why aren't we doing something similar? So I can speak to the testing part of it is, you know, just because you test a person on entry doesn't mean that they're going to be negative two days later. Uh, and uh, they um, uh, may still be able to transmit the virus in that situation. So, uh, you know, testing in and of itself is not an effective way to reduce um, the introduction of uh, the virus into uh, your into the province. Minister Hagee, it sounds like you wanted to jump in there. Uh, I was just going to go along the lines that um, Dr. Fitzgerald had. I mean, the challenge with this test is it's a diagnostic test and not a screening test, and that presents the challenges that Dr. Fitzgerald has outlined. Uh, I think uh, we need to bear that in mind when we look at any test because, again, similarly, antibody testing, uh, should we uh, get to a situation where we have that available, there's still debate about what actually that means in terms of immunity to either a second bout of COVID-19 or the ability to uh, regard oneself as truly immune. Uh, so I, I think, really, uh, the, the aim, as I understand it, the discussions that Dr. Fitzgerald and others have been having, uh, and myself with my colleagues in government, has been around how to, uh, how to make the best, how to adapt to a staycation approach for the rest of the summer. Uh, and there are possibilities there. Certainly it will uh, preclude uh, for a significant period international uh, visitors. But the facts of the case are uh, it's, it's a risk management exercise. We need to be sure that what we let into this province we can deal with. And on the topic of testing, a private lab in St. John's is now offering COVID testing for businesses who want to test their employees, for example. Do you recommend that employers do this, and how useful are those results? So I think you have to remember, as I just said, that a, a negative test is only indicative of that day's result. And uh, if you're relying on testing to keep your workplace safe, uh, outside of all the other measures that uh, we have recommended be in place, then um, I think you know you're going to find that that method will fail. So um, testing is is one part of a puzzle uh, with regard to diagnosis. We're using a diagnostic test to screen people. That's not always effective. Um, so you know certainly any 
anyone who's considering um, doing that, you need to consider the whole picture. Um, and that's making sure that you're screening your employees, that you have all those public health measures are still in place uh, because uh, a negative test today doesn't mean a negative test tomorrow. The only sure okay. screening test for uh, COVID-19, Peter, is 14 days of isolation. Uh, and I think attempts to find a loophole by using tests that were not designed that way may not be the safest way of dealing with that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Kellyanne, if you would press star one. Operator, are you able to manually open her line there? We'll move on to Ben Murphy of VOCM News, and we'll come back to Kellyanne. So, Ben Murphy, please press star one. Are the guidelines for businesses opening in Alert Level 3 available online at uh, government COVID website? But can you speak to what some of those guidelines are going to be for places like hair, nail salons, and medical care that might be like physio or massage clinics? So um, the guidelines for uh, private health clinics, uh, certainly we're um, in discussions now. We've uh, had some uh, feedback from, from those groups, and, and we will be uh, looking at the information that they've given us. And uh, the same uh, can go for... Um, um, salons as well if uh, if there are questions about that um, certainly we know that uh, the physical distancing measures and, and things can be difficult in these situations and so there are other things that uh, need to happen such as screening clients uh, um, wearing masks that sort of thing uh, but uh, we will be engaging in the in the next uh, couple of weeks with regard to uh, um, those processes for for those uh, groups of uh, uh, individuals and businesses. Okay, thank you. And um, despite the one recovery or, or one person moved out of ICU last week, there have been three people in hospital and, and one in ICU for quite some time. Are these the same people that have been there for the, the whole time or have there been people moving in and out? Um, uh, so My understanding... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Minister. Uh, my understanding is that at least one of those uh, people in intensive care uh, is different uh, than was the case a couple of weeks ago, and we have uh, had uh, no other change that I'm aware of. Uh, again, the numbers are very small, and I'm rather loath to go into too much detail uh, because of issues around patient confidentiality. And lastly, Premier, I'm hearing from substitute teachers who say the provincial government still has really done nothing for them despite three weeks ago saying they have with, you know, things like child care centers opening and some opportunities there. But that's only really a handful of jobs for some 1,000 substitutes. And they say they were paid a one-time $625 payment benefit from the NLTA, but the government would not match that. What do you say to these substitutes who feel like they've just been being neglected by government throughout this? Well, we know there is a number of federal programs for people that have been impacted by COVID-19 within Newfoundland and Labrador. These federal programs are, are available, so people can apply for those. Uh, there's provisions within, you know, the provincial government to support, you know, to work with the NLTA and therefore substitute teachers as well. That work will continue to go, uh, will continue on. Uh, currently, right now, we're doing accessing where the gaps would be with federal programs and provincial programs. That work is being completed now by the Cabinet Committee on Jobs and so on to see where the gaps could be filled by the provincial government. So these are the uh, these are the areas that we're exploring and the options that people that have been impacted by federal and provincial decisions that they have available to them. Thank you. We'll go back to Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. calling for the House to reopen and make changes to Bill 38. He says the government failed to live up to its agreement and exemptions for family reunification in the travel ban. Will the House reopen to re uh, repeal the bill? 
So the, the House can reopen, I guess, is that to call it a House leader and, and the other, the opposition leaders, those that will be involved in, you know, typically when the House of Assembly would come back, it would come back in to deal with, you know, House of Assembly legislative measures right now. And as you know, I guess this is all coming down to uh, a letter that would have been received on Saturday night of, uh, of the weekend here from the Canadian Bar Association. I really do want to thank them for uh, the professional uh, work that they've done in in looking at this piece of legislation that went in place about two weeks ago. Of course, we all know this was a matter of enforcement. It was about decisions that were being made under the state of emergency, the public health state of emergency. And I also know and, and feel and, and send out my condolences and sympathies to the families. I can't imagine what it'd be like to receive a call and not be able to attend you know, a funeral or so on. It's, it's gotta be very difficult but understanding where we are with the state of emergency and some of the difficult uh, decisions that would have been made. It's, it's about, as the letter says, about uh, finding the balance between the proper legislation and the proper uh, measures that would have been put in place to stop the spread of COVID-19. So uh, justice and public safety, along with public health officials, you know, once uh, I understand there's a statement of, of claim that will be filed, and they will respond appropriately when, when the time is right. But once again, I do send out my condolences and, and, uh, and sympathies to those families that are impacted. Uh, this is for Dr. Fitzgerald. For those who are coming home uh, to attend a funeral, um, those types of services, and are to arrive and the funeral is to happen in the next few days, um, how does the self-isolation work in that case, knowing that there has to be 14 days, but yet a funeral could be happening in that time frame? So the requirement for self-isolation is still a requirement, um, uh, and that's all I can really say about that, I guess. All right. Uh, Minister Hagee, a news release from uh, Health Today was issued regarding the tentative agreement with the Nurses Union, saying these amendments include a salary increase and a reduction to long-term financial liabilities through the changes to post-employment benefits for new employees. What does this mean? So what uh, this means that HR... Yeah, okay, I can just, you know, just respond to that and you can build on there, Minister. This is really an extension of two years. There's been some very positive discussions uh, that was occurring prior to the pandemic with the Nurses Union, with other unions as well. NAEP, as you know, had an opportunity to ratify with most of their uh, bargaining units. Uh, the Nurses Union had some real good discussions and so therefore there's an agreement on the two-year uh, two extension for the Nurses Union. Minister, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I think, uh, like they say, what he said. Okay. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of the Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. We've had about four new cases reported since April 18th, and the last of those was almost two weeks ago. Uh, so even with the hospitalizations, how are there still five active cases by my reckoning? So uh, depending on um, where somebody, uh, if somebody was admitted to hospital, uh, it has to do with the definition of recovered, I guess, uh, is the uh, short answer. Uh, so if somebody was admitted to hospital, uh, they aren't considered recovered until they have two negative uh, tests uh, at least 24 hours apart. And for some people, unfortunately, especially if they have quite severe disease, uh, they can shed the virus uh, for quite some time and it may take a while for them to, to have two negative tests uh, 24 hours apart. Um, so that is, um, that is part of the reason why you still see um, what are technically active cases. And uh, on a, deep, uh, a recent day, uh, or on a good day, you can still see people at Middle Cold Beach, uh, despite the fact that there are barricades up. I'm wondering what approach the government has taken towards uh, beaches such as Middle Cove and Salmon Cove, places like that, where you normally see hundreds of visitors when the weather warms up. Yes, yeah, so Peter. And first of all, I want to say and apologize to the minister. Obviously, for those that are viewing would know the minister is not in the room. So there is a bit of a delay as, as he's responding remotely today. So, uh, so if, you see, if, if you see us cut each other off from time to time, it's not intentionally. It's just that there is a bit of a delay that we'll kind of work with here. 
uh, through this process. But when it comes to access to parks and sites and so on and areas that have been currently restricted, Peter, I will say this, that you know, right now we, you know, what this is is about preventing gatherings and, and preventing the sp spread of the virus within our province. I know uh, over the weekend, as, as I just mentioned earlier, driving across the province, we saw very limited uh, a number of cases where people in large numbers would have been gathering. So we want to thank the people of our province how they responded over this weekend. Uh, but, you know, from time to time, you will get people that will see that they want to go out and look for loopholes, as the minister has said, and, and find ways to gather in larger numbers. They do so uh, at their own risk, at their own peril, recognizing that this virus is still within, is in our province, is living amongst us. So, you know, for the most part, people are compliant, but from time to time, people will not want to follow the rules. And there's reporting mechanisms that are in place for those individuals that will want to file a, a file report. But we encourage people to really do not take the risk, do not be looking for loopholes. If areas are, uh, are closed and not open for public access, stay away from those. Stay away from those until we get to the appropriate place within the alert system that people can visit them safely. Okay, uh, and I, just one last uh, follow-up to that. We, uh, uh, with regards to education, um, we continue to hear from parents and educators that the overall thrust of what they say is that the uh, virtual learning has been a bit of a flop. And I'm wondering what guarantee the province can have that, that it would get its act together by September if it comes to that. Well, this is a plan that's been put in place now, Peter, and when you think about it, just really we've been dealing with this over a matter of, what, 12 weeks or so right now when schools were closed. We're dealing with a K-12 to system, much more difficult when you look at trying to provide education remotely with, with younger classes. I want to say a big shout-out to many of the teachers that did step up during this time and provide some real good information uh, to those students, and, we incur and the continued learning did occur. Uh, school after schools were closed. Schools are now closed for the remainder of the year. Uh, reporting cards will be out on June the 22nd and final transcripts on June, July the 6th. But with that said, the planning is proceeding with next year for September opening, whatever opening looks like, continued online services or some, or some kind of hybrid of what a classroom would look like. But there's some work to be done. The, Easter, the English and, and, and Francophone school districts are working with NLTA, working with the departments to make sure that, number one, the equipment's in place, uh, the teachers have the professional developments that's required uh, to remotely do the, put in place a proper education program. Newfoundland Labrador is not the only one facing this challenge, so we will work together as, with other provinces as well. But we're very confident that we can get a, a good program in place in September if schools do not open um, what would have been a typical school year for students. Our next questions are from Elizabeth Witt of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we reported last week that the private company testing, uh, offering COVID-19 testing is Paul Antle's chemical testing firm at Vallon Laboratories. So I was wondering, has the government been in talks with Mr. Antle on this service? I haven't been in talk with him. I don't know if anyone with public health would have been. It's not, some, no, not discussions I would have had. No, no discussions from public health. And as a follow-up to that, you know, as the province moves through these alert levels and towards our new normal, um, I'm wondering, do you anticipate uh, the need for testing to change in any way? Well, what I know, I could speak, I guess, from a, a federal level. There's, I know there's discussions around a national strategy on testing, but as you know, both the chief medical officer and the minister have, have articulated quite often at this table about how testing is performed within Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, so testing is, you know, it's a national strategy, you know, that they're looking at right now that has not been finalized. I think we'll get an update, you know, through this week. So testing, at what role testing will be as a component of reopening up uh, businesses. But I will tell you, one of the most important things that we will need to have in place is uh, an adequate supply of personal protective equipment and make sure that we have good contact tracing. We have a good system in place already for contact tracing, but is there a way to improve that? This is all about, you know, stopping the spread of COVID-19. And as we reopen our economy, realizing that this COVID still exists, and we must make sure that we can appropriately, appropriately respond with the proper, uh, you know, PPE and contact tracing that's required. And you kind of touched on the, the follow-up question I wanted to ask. 
about the public health lab here. Uh, I was wondering, what are our current testing capabilities at the moment? Because I know it's changed and, and expanded over the past few months. I can address that, um, Elizabeth. We, we have currently the ability to do 700 tests per day. Um, if uh, we get a new piece of equipment, which was ordered but didn't come last week, um, and we were prepared or needed to staff the lab round the clock 24-7, uh, we could actually get that number up to 2,600. Um, the capacity of the lab uh, would only be limited essentially by, uh, practically at the moment, by our ability to collect specimens and the dependence of that on PPE. We have followed on the advice of Dr. Fitzgerald um, the broadest of the um, recommendations that PHAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, put out there for this test. Uh, so we are testing a wide variety of people with symptoms and also groups who are at particularly high risk, such as seniors going into long-term care uh, and uh, healthcare workers who may be asymptomatic, those kind of things. There's a long shopping list of those, and we've not got anywhere near our, our practical daily maximum yet. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, Premier, I'm wondering what you uh, make of uh, the uh, statement by Chess Crosby uh, demanding that Bill 38 uh, be debated once again in the House of Assembly uh, and uh, the idea of reopening it at, at this stage after it's been uh, voted on by, uh, by all, I, I mean, all, I guess all MHA. Yeah, so the, I think the statement that was made by, you know, Mr. Crosby, it wasn't a scathing, as, as you know, I think the news release said it was a scathing, uh, you know, reporter back to government. It wasn't that way at all. It was a very professional, well-written letter based on the analysis that they had and some of the concerns that they had addressed. So there's a process now with justice and public safety and public health officials that we will, uh, uh, that we will follow if, you know, if amendments would need to be made. What this... All objective here is trying to prevent the uh, spread of COVID-19 within our province. And these public health measures were put in place during the state of emergency, a public health state of emergency in our province. So there's a process that we'll follow. And if indeed this ends up in, in a court in the future, well, you know, the province will prepare and, and respond in the appropriate way. But as I said earlier, uh, I, I, I can't imagine what it's like to get a call and you've lost a loved one and not being able to attend a funeral. But, you know, these are the tough decisions that have been, uh, been made in the past uh, based on the information that's been provided under what is a process for exemption orders. So, uh, you know, we'll let the process unfold and, uh, you know, through the information that's been provided for us. But it was not a, a scathing. It was very professionally written, and we thank them for their submission. Uh, the, I believe you might be alluding to this. The, the Canadian Bar Association wrote you a letter on the, on the 15th of, of, of May um, demanding modifications to Bill 38. Um, how do you respond specifically to that letter? Well, as I just said, you know, we'll, just, we'll go through uh, justice and public health, uh, justice and public safety, along with public health officials and the department. They will get involved. They will get involved in in the response here. As I said, you know, through my uh, comments here just a, a few seconds ago. These measures were put in place to uh, stop the spread of COVID within our province. Uh, special orders were put in place by a chief medical officer. So we'll respond to the letter, but by to the Canadian Bar Association. We want to thank them for, uh, uh, for their letter, and it was one that we received, I received, on, late sa or on Saturday night. So uh, they've been through this. Just, the justice officials are working along with the uh, public health officials on the appropriate response. Um, and we know there's tourism operators uh, in this province getting gearing up for uh, what some are calling staycation summer. Um, they're looking for guidance now on what the rules will be and what, what gear they might have to install, things like plexiglass screens, wondering how uh, the sorts of equipment that they might have to put in place, measures they might have to take. Where can they get that information right now, given that, you know, at this point they're preparing for... Um, that sort of potential activity this summer. Where can they where can they find information that they need um, at this point? Yeah. So on the COVID nineteen website where this information is is provided, there's a business guidance uh, group there that's been established. If the if it's not specific enough, if there's further questions, there is a group that we have in place at the you know tourism culture of. Uh, 
uh, industry and innovation. These are these are people that are working very closely with the tourism industry, recognizing that you know some operators would uh, you know could open up and provide you know safe accommodations you know for for travelers on a staycation program. We want to see people you know we want to see and work with those you know those operators. Some of them may be able to open in a very safe manner. We hope they can. And for those that you know, find themselves in a situation that they cannot, well, there are federal programs to support them, but there will be provincial support as well. This is one industry I think that we all recognize that will be hit extremely hard. And as a province, we want to be there to support them as we get through this this summer and make them ready for next summer when hopefully we're we're through this uh, this health crisis. Thank you, Premier. We'll now start a single line of questions, starting with Peter Cowan of CBC. Please go ahead. On the line of that questioning, uh, when it comes to staycation, we still don't know under what conditions we're going to allow non-essential travel. Considering we now have, if I've done the math right, there's uh, essentially only three or four cases outside of hospital settings. Um, are we ready, or when will we be ready, to allow people to be able to travel for a vacation within the province? So those are discussions that we are having in the public health team at this time, and uh, as soon as we um, uh, have that evaluation, I guess we will be letting people know. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Similar line here. I know Tyler Dunn asked this question last week regarding level three, and we noted closer to. Um, is there a rough indication on when um, businesses and just the general public can get an idea about a better indication of what level three will look like in terms of bubble expansion and things like that? So we hope in the next... Uh um, few days to a week that we'll have more information on that. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. We'll next hear from Ben Murphy of BOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, Newfoundland and Labrador's Beverage Association is calling on the provincial government to change the alert level schedules and allow restaurants, bars, and lounges to open immediately. Um, what do you say to that? Uh, so... Anything that we do is based on a risk assessment, and certainly our risk assessment at the moment does not uh, um, really recommend that that happen. So. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, the uh, Global Mail had a very dismal uh, account of Newfoundland finance uh, in the future. Uh, it, it, has the government... Uh, made any measures uh, in terms of creating a task force or any kind of a, in the absence of debate in the House Assembly to talk about finances rather than just getting insurance every day at the, uh, the COVID-19 briefing? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing right now, as I've been mentioned already, and it's, I guess most people would late March would have seen my letter that went, I went to the Prime Minister. I mean, this province were from a financial impact coming out of the oil uh, the oil prices and the impact that that was having on the decline in revenues of oil revenues, nearly 30 percent of the GDP in our province. So we've been looking for support from the federal government to make sure that Newfoundland and Labrador remains competitive from the oil and gas industry. We also knew that the, and expecting in the, in the federal budget, which didn't occur simply because of this pandemic, that there was some support coming to Newfoundland and Labrador through a new fiscal sustainability uh, fund that would have been available to, uh, to uh, our province simply because we are not receiving equalization, as everyone in this province would know. So for us, uh, the, we'll continue to work with the federal government from a task force point of view. So currently we're working on the uh, COVID-19 measures that we, we will be there to support some of the businesses that you've just mentioned here as an example within tourism. But work will continue, and I'm more than willing to work with the all-party, with an all-party committee. I said this to both opposition leaders right now, that all 40 MHAs within our province, I think, uh, would be... Uh, would play a role, but an all-party committee and a task force set for uh, the economic future, financial future of Newfoundland and Labrador is something that I would be uh, very uh, open to and would welcome. I think all Newfoundland and Labrador would benefit from seeing all parties working together on the future uh, financial impacts of our province. Thank you. Our next question is from Elizabeth Witt of all Newfoundland and Labrador. Please go ahead. 
Uh, I was wondering, what is the province of supply of re reagents that are needed for this test? It was mentioned, uh, I think, over a month ago that New Brunswick, a company in New Brunswick was gearing up to supply Canada, and I was curious how that has gone through. That hasn't quite panned out yet from New Brunswick. My last um, information was that I think we had more than uh, enough reagents to do more than 38,000 tests. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. With the uh, contract tracing app, I, I think this was asked uh, recently, but uh, just wondering if there's an update uh, on uh, a timeline for when you're hoping to, uh, to release that. So for the contact tracing app, yeah, sorry, John, I was waiting for your, uh, but the, and, and the minister would have, you know, some updated uh, information on that for the uh, contact tracing app. You know, from what I know, the minister can give you uh, further details on this. Uh, from the one for Newfoundland and Labrador, I think we're a couple of weeks away, but I know across the, the country right now, there are a number of apps that are being designed by, by, uh, by many provinces right now. Alberta already has one in place. Uh, New, New Brunswick is working on one as we're working with a, a local operator and a local great company here in Newfoundland and Labrador on an app. And I, I anticipate, unless John's got an update on this, that was still probably a couple of weeks away for us. Well, that's the information I have uh, as of last week, if the timeline still holds. We're looking at about two weeks uh, for, for getting, it, uh, getting it out there. Thank you, Minister. We're now going to take uh, three more questions. So please press star one and the operator will identify you. Our first question is from Peter Cohen. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, I understand you met with uh, RV owners, or I guess the uh, campground owners, have uh, put forward a proposal on how they think they can operate safely, uh, and most other provinces have included them earlier. Uh, is there any update on will you be moving up some of those uh, measures related to camping? So we did meet with them, and we had a great discussion, and uh, the public health team has taken their information back now, and we are certainly... Uh, uh, considering the information that they've given us, and uh, we'll have a decision in the near future. Next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Ben Murphy. Please go ahead. Thank you, Premier. I just wanted to go back to the uh, tentative agreement the registered nurses unit reached with government. Uh, given the essential nature of nurses during this pandemic, how important is it that a deal with that salary increase was reached? I think labor certainty within Newfoundland Labrador for uh, for all our groups is extremely important. So uh, the uh, the negotiating teams were able to successfully with NAEP prior to the pandemic, and this agreement with the nurses now are a result of you know the discussions that would have been had prior to the pandemic, and so now they were able to conclude those and get an agreement in place. So I think it's in, extremely important for all uh, government employees or all our public sector employees. And nurses, you know, Nurses Week, or, and nurses, of course, providing essential ser services during the pandemic. But this is as a result of negotiations that had occurred prior to the pandemic. Thank you. Our next question. Our next question is from Peter Jackson. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Uh, uh, speaking of updates, uh, I'm curious to know whether any further consideration has been given to tennis, Newfoundland, and Labrador regarding uh, the fact that we're one of the only provinces who won't allow tennis. Yes, so we have gotten information from Tennis Newfoundland and Labrador, and we are reviewing it. Uh, and again, uh, we will be having updates with regard to um, um, any um, anything with regard to tennis in the, in the upcoming days. Thank you. And just because we have a few minutes left, we'll take just one more question, and that will be from... Our last question, I don't have the name, but please go ahead. I believe it is Ms. Kellyanne. Hi, I'm wondering if we've got any um, new information regarding this past weekend on how many people were turned around at the border, for our borders. The only information I have is, as of last night, one person voluntarily left for the back, back on the ferry. Um, we had... Um, uh, 131 people in the last 24 hours. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The time for questions today has ended. Please join us again tomorrow at 2 p.m., 1.30 in Most of Labrador. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.